Okay, so in today's video, we'll be going over a couple of high yield complications related to pregnancy, placenta previa and placenta abruption. I apologize, I've been gone for a long time, but I plan on making many new videos in the near future. And thank you as always for the support, the comments, anybody who's bought a t-shirt, signed up for the subscription. Thank you so much for everything. I truly do appreciate it. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're gonna start with placental abruption, AKA abruptio placentae. What is this? Well, this is a partial or complete separation of the placenta at or after 20 weeks of gestation. So we have a premature separation of the placenta from the uterus. We'll talk about why this happens in a moment, but first let's talk about timing. So why is the timing important? Why is it generally only considered a placental abruption if it occurs after 20 weeks? Well, if this happens prior to 20 weeks, in that case, it's usually considered to be part of a spontaneous abortion rather than an abruption, except for some rare cases. And then it also has to be prior to fetal expulsion. And this part's pretty obvious. After the fetus is delivered, the placenta naturally separates from the wall of the uterus. And so this is no longer an abnormal finding. So again, timing, it's after 20 weeks and prior to delivery of the fetus. All right, so we have this placental abruption, the separation of the placenta. Why is this happening? Let's talk about the patho next. It's due to a rupture of the maternal vessels in the decidua basalis. So this is the main area to focus on for patho. Thrombin also plays a role with the clinical consequences seen, contractions, tissue breakdown, etc. But the rupture of the maternal vessels in the decidua basalis is what you need to know. So quick anatomy review for the placenta. Uh, the placenta is where the nutrient and gas exchange occurs between the mother and the fetus. It has two sides, the baby side called the chorion and the mother side, the decidua basalis, which is attached to the uterine wall. Uh, the decidua, the decidua basalis contains the uh, maternal blood vessels, arteries, and veins that supply oxygen-rich blood to the fetus. And in a placental abruption, the vessels in the decidua basalis, mom's side, become damaged or weakened, causing them to rupture, which obviously leads to significant bleeding, causing a hematoma, and all of this pushes the uterine wall and the placenta apart. The separation can be partial or complete depending on the severity of the, ble uh, of the bleed. Um, so to recap, in placental abruption, vessels in the decidua basalis rupture. These ruptured vessels bleed and accumulate, which eventually causes the placenta to separate and peel away. So then the next question becomes, why did these vessels rupture in the first place? And that takes us to our risk factors. So think, what are some things that damage and weaken blood vessels that can disrupt vascular integrity? Let's start with an easy one, and that's smoking. So this is one of the few modifiable risk factors. It's associated with a fourfold increased risk, and it's thought to be related to its vasoconstriction restrictive effects. Another one is uh, cocaine. So again, vasoconstriction, ischemia, etc. Up to 10% of pregnant women using cocaine in the third trimester will develop an abruption. Hypertension, this one's really important. Five-fold increased risk compared to normal tensive patients. Obviously, anytime the blood pressure is increased, you can have arterial wall damage. Um, trauma, so blunt trauma, a motor vehicle accident, fall, etc. Even though this isn't the most common risk factor, it's definitely popular on exam questions. I had this one in school. So in trauma, like a motor vehicle accidents, for instance, um, you have this rapid acceleration, deceleration of the uterus. So the uterine wall stretches with this sudden movement as the uterus is actually pretty flexible, but the placenta, it's not so stretchy, so it stays in place and you have this shearing force that just rips the two apart. And then our last risk factor, which is going to be a previous abruption, um, like so many things in medicine, if you had it before, there's a good chance you'll have it again. And then in the case of a placental abruption, it's a very good chance. So there's some other risk factors, but those are the five to focus on, smoking, cocaine, hypertension, trauma, and previous abruption. All right, let's talk about something super high yield next, and that's our clinical manifestations. So for clinical manifestations, there's really two things that you really need to know, and that's pain and bleeding. Neither one is 100% in real life, but in preparation for an exam, you need to assume you'll be given the most common clinical presentation, which is abrupt onset of vaginal bleeding and mild to moderate abdominal pain. So let's talk about that. So vaginal bleeding, this is usually going to be abrupt in onset, and this is a key component, but it's not very specific because there's obviously other causes of third trimester bleeding, like with placenta previa, which we'll go over next. And then there is something called a concealed abruption where most of the blood is actually trapped behind the placenta. And in these cases, even in a very severe abruption, there may be little to no vaginal bleeding. So that's clinical knowledge, but for an exam, always be thinking classic presentation, which is abrupt onset of vaginal bleeding, as this will be how the vast majority of patients present, around 80% of individuals with placental abruption. 
So let's talk about the pain next. So abdominal pain, uterine contractions. So this pain is usually associated with those uterine contractions, which are often high frequency and low amplitude. Um, so the abdominal pain, it's important because on an exam in some cases, the only thing to differentiate an abruption from placenta previa is the mention of some type of abdominal pain. So classic presentation, mild to moderate abdominal pain is going to be typical. Back pain is also a possibility when the placenta is on the posterior wall of the uterus. Um, in some cases, the abdominal pain can be severe. So abdominal pain, again, very important to remember. So clinical manifestations, nothing's 100% in medicine, but for the exam, associate placental abruption with painful vaginal bleeding at or after 20 weeks gestation. Next, let's talk about our physical exam. So really just one thing to focus on that is really important because it's another key to help you on your exam question, and that is the uterus. It's going to be tender and rigid on exam. You may also hear it being described as hypertonic, which just means high muscle tone, uh, which is from those frequent contractions. So really important to remember, rigid, tender, or hypertonic uterus. Okay, diagnosis next. So an acute placental abruption, it's mainly a clinical diagnosis, and you should, you should suspect this in any pregnant patient that has abrupt onset of vaginal bleeding, abdominal pain, contractions, especially in the presence of uterine tenderness and increased uterine tone, as we talked about just before. Um, there are some other things that can help support the diagnosis, fetal heart rate abnormalities, disseminated intravascular coagulation, which can be associated with abruption. Remember, this is mainly a clinical diagnosis suspected in any patient with sudden onset vaginal bleeding, abdominal pain, contractions, tender and rigid uterus. With that being said, you should also know ultrasound can be helpful. And what you should know for your ultrasound finding is something that's called a retroplacental hematoma, so a clot behind the placenta. If this is present, this strongly supports the diagnosis. And on an exam question, if you see this mentioned, slam dunk, it's a placental abruption. In real life, it can be absent in a good deal of patients, so it's great if it's present, but it's it's not so helpful when it's not. Ultrasound is also uh, helpful to, of course, rule out your differentials, such as placenta previa, which we'll go over next. So again, diagnosis, mainly clinical, but if an ultrasound is obtained, classic finding is a retroplacental hematoma. Okay, so let's talk about treatment. Treatment, it depends on a lot of factors, including the hemodynamic stability of the mother, the status of the fetus, and I don't think that the questions you'll get will be about treatment, but just so you have an idea, part of the treatment is focused on uh, hemodynamic support for the mother, so things like stabilization, blood transfusion, IV fluids, etc. of course, continuous fetal heart rate monitoring, and then depending on a, a number of factors, often emergent delivery is indicated, whether by vaginal or cesarean birth. Okay, so quick recap, placental abruption, placental the placenta is peeling away from the uterus prematurely. This is at or after 20 weeks of gestation and prior to birth. Those maternal vessels, whether diseased from hypertension, smoking, or damaged from car accident fall, have ruptured and are filling that separated space with blood. Most often we'll see bleeding on physical exam. In some cases, the bleeding can be hidden. One thing I want you to remember is this patient will very likely be in pain very likely, contractions, etc. The uterus is going to be tender and rigid. Diagnosis is made clinically. Ultrasound, if it shows a retro placental hematoma, slam dunk, but it doesn't always. Four things you need to remember that always come up in the description on an exam question, that's pain, bleeding, the rigid uterus, and contractions. This is how I remembered it, and hopefully it'll help you too. Instead of placental abruption, I used to remember it as placental crab eruption. Placental crab eruption, think of a, a crab with its little claws literally snipping the placenta away from the uterine wall, which obviously can be painful. Um, and crab stands for four super important things you need to remember that will be in the description on the exam question. C is for contractions, R is for rigid, as in rigid or hypertonic uterus, A is for abdominal pain, so important, and B is for bleeding. Again, placental crab eruption, crab, contractions, rigid, abdominal pain, bleeding. All right, let's talk about the um, next condition, which will be very similar in many ways to placental abruption, and that's placenta previa. So placenta previa is the presence of placental tissue that extends over or near the internal cervical os. So really straightforward, in a normal pre uh, pregnancy, the placenta is usually right around the top of the uterus. In placenta previa, it's actually at the bottom of the uterus, sometimes covering the entire cervical os. This can cause a number of problems which we'll go over, but placenta previa, the placenta is in the wrong spot, plugging up the internal cervical os in varying degrees. 
Now, why this happens, we're not really sure, which is good news from an exam standpoint as one less thing to remember. But one hypothesis is that the upper uterine cavity where the placenta normally would implant is not well vascularized, whether this is due to previous surgery, multiparity, or other issues. Um, so the placenta is kind of shifted down. Um, so a quick mnemonic, placental abruption, which we just went over, the placenta was moving away from the uterus. In placenta previa, the placenta is plugging up the uterus. So placental abruption, placenta away, placenta previa, placenta plug. Placenta previa has a P, so remember the placenta is plugging up the uterus. Um, and placental abruption has an A. So remember the placenta is moving away from the uterus. So those are just, uh, it's just another way to help you remember the differences between the two. All right. So with placenta previa, what are some risk factors you should know? There's three um, main ones that you need to focus on, starting with a previous placenta previa. Um, again, like so many things in medicine, if you had it before, there's a higher risk of having it again. Another one is previous cesarean birth. And then finally, multiple gestation. So carrying more than one baby at a time, twins, etc. One study actually found placenta previa was 40% higher among twin births than uh, among singleton births. There's other risk factors, increasing maternal age, smoking, cocaine use, male fetus, but focus on the three we went over above if you're even going to bother memorizing risk factors at all, because to be honest, they're not the highest yield thing to know. With that being said, let's talk about something that is very high yield, and that's the clinical manifestations. So let's start with the fact that this may be an asymptomatic finding on routine ultrasound at approximately 18 to 20 weeks of gestation. So the majority of placenta previas will actually be found um, on mid-trimester ultrasound examination, and luckily about 90% identified on ultrasound at 18 to 20 weeks will resolve before delivery. But this isn't what you should remember for the exam. On the exam, they're not going to give you an asymptomatic patient. What they're going to give you is a patient with painless vaginal bleeding. Painless, I'll repeat it again, painless vaginal bleeding in the second half of pregnancy. The most common symptom of uh, placenta previa is painless vaginal bleeding. I keep saying that because it's so important. This occurs in up to 90% of the cases. Compare this to placental abruption, which again, remember, more often than not had painful bleeding. So placenta previa, painless bleeding. Now in real life, 10 to 20% of patients with placenta previa may have some pain from uterine contractions, et cetera, but re remember, we're focusing uh, for an exam. And for an exam, remember the most common presentation, which is painless vaginal bleeding. All right, I think I've said that enough. So how do you remember that? Well, instead of placenta previa, remember it as placenta stevia. Placenta previa is now placenta stevia. Stevia is the sugar-free or sugarless sweetener. Placenta previa is the pain-free or painless vaginal bleeding. It worked for me. Hopefully it helps you too. Uh, placenta stevia, sugar-free sweetener, and then pain-free vaginal bleeding. All right. Um, so with diagnosis, what I want to start with is actually what you do not want to do. And this will often be tested on. So you do not want to perform a digital vaginal exam. Do not want to perform a digital vaginal exam. Anytime there is vaginal bleeding in the second or third trimester, a digital examination is absolutely contraindicated until you perform ultrasound and rule out a placenta previa. If you perform a digital vaginal exam on a patient with placenta previa, remember the placenta, it's in the wrong spot, positioned low in the uterus, covering or near the cervix and a digital exam can reach this area and dislodge the placenta's attachment site. And it could cause severe bleeding. So remember that because it definitely could be a question. Okay, so now that we know what we shouldn't do, what should we do to make the diagnosis? And that's going to be using um, ultrasound. Um, this is how you diagnose placenta previa. Ultrasound is what you need to know. So you usually start with a transabdominal ultrasound as a screening test. And then the gold standard is with transvaginal ultrasound, which provides better detail and better defines the placental position. Now we just said never do a digital vaginal exam on a patient with suspected placenta previa. Why the heck can we do a transvaginal ultrasound? Well, with a transvaginal ultrasound, you're able to visualize the anatomy so you're not going in blind, and the optimal position of the vaginal probe is actually far enough away from the cervix to make this a safe test. So when you do the ultrasound, what are we looking for to confirm the diagnosis? So that is going to be placental tissue visualized over the internal cervical os. Okay, so again, for diagnosis, do not perform a digital vaginal exam, do perform an ultrasound. What about treatment next? So just like with placental abruption, I don't think many or any questions will be asked about management, but just to have a general idea, um, monitoring in asymptomatic patients where placenta previa is seen on routine ultrasound at 18 to 22 weeks, uh, close monitoring is an option. Hemostasis, if you have a mother with an active, uh, actively bleeding placenta previa, this is a potential obstetric emergency. So monitoring maternal hemodynamic status, blood transfusion, monitoring uh, fetal heart rate. Once the bleeding has resolved in some patients, patient's outpatient management is actually reasonable. You want to recommend patient avoid excess physical activity, avoid sexual intercourse. Some women will receive uh, antenatal corticosteroid therapy. 
And then when delivery is recommended, um, in some patients, vaginal delivery can be an option, but quite often cesarean birth is going to be recommended. Okay, so placenta previa, this is the abnormal presence of placental tissue that extends over or near the internal cervical os. While this may be an asymptomatic finding on a routine exam, the classic symptom of placenta previa that you will not forget is painless vaginal bleeding. Up to 90% of persistent cases will have painless painless, painless vaginal bleeding. Remember, placenta stevia, sugar-free, pain-free. Diagnosis, do not perform a digital vaginal exam. Do perform an ultrasound. Treatment, manage the bleeding, observe and deliver when appropriate. That's placenta previa. Now let's do a quick recap of what I feel are the highest yield things to know for both placental abruption and placenta previa. Okay, so placental abruption is premature separation of the placenta from the uterus. Placenta previa is abnormal placental tissue over or near the internal cervical os. So in placental abruption, placenta is moving away from the uterus. Placenta previa, placenta is plugging up the uterus. Remember, placental abruption has an A, so placenta is moving away from the uterus. Placenta previa has a P, so placenta is plugging up the uterus. Next presentation, um, placental abruption has painful bleeding, cramping along with the rigid hypertonic uterus on physical exam. Remember your placenta placental crab ruption. And then placenta previa, remember you're going to have your painless bleeding. How you remember that is placenta stevia, remember your sugar-free, pain-free um, placenta previa. Uh, you do not perform a digital vaginal examination with placenta previa. This can cause severe hemorrhage. And then finally, with placental abruption, a retroplacental hematoma is a classic ultrasound finding. So those are the most important things to remember about these two conditions. So take a look at that, remember those for your exam, and then let's do some questions, starting with question one. A 32-year-old G3P2 woman presents to the emergency department at 28 weeks gestation with painless vaginal bleeding that started an hour ago. She denies any contractions, abdominal pain, or trauma. Her pregnancy has been uncomplicated up until now. On examination, she is hemodynamically stable and the fetal heart rate is 145 beats per minute. Which of the following should be avoided in the workup of this patient? So A, transabdominal ultrasound, B, transvaginal ultrasound, C, digital vaginal examination, or D, fetal heart rate monitoring. So we're looking for what should be avoided in the workup of this patient. So I'll give you a minute to think about that. Okay, so the answer is going to be C, digital vaginal examination. And I'm sure that was super easy for you because I definitely stressed that. All right, so we have a pregnant patient with vaginal bleeding after 20 weeks gestation. G3P2, meaning three pregnancies, two births at term. Uh, the vignette clearly states there is no pain or contractions. So while we can't definitively say this is a placenta preview without imaging, it should definitely be high on the list of differentials as that's the classic symptoms or presentation that we talked about before. The most important thing to remember is that anytime a patient has vaginal bleeding late in pregnancy, no matter what the suspected cause or what you think it may be, you do not do a digital vaginal examination until you rule out placenta previa, as this can lead to severe hemorrhage. So the other answer is, answer is ultrasound for both answers A and B. This is first line imaging to assess placental position. That includes the transvaginal ultrasound, which can be safely performed even with placenta previa. And fetal heart rate monitoring, that's always appropriate with active vaginal bleeding. So uh, in a pregnant patient, again, remember answer C, digital vaginal examination, is the only choice that is absolutely contraindicated until previa is ruled out. Question two, <clears throat> a 35-year-old G4P3 female, currently 36 weeks pregnant, presents to the emergency department after being involved in a motor vehicle accident. She's complaining of severe abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding. She admits to using cigarettes and cocaine during her pregnancy. Abdominal exam reveals a rigid uterus with palpable uterine contractions and blood is observed in the vaginal vault. If an ultrasound were performed, which of the following findings would be most consistent with the likely diagnosis? So A, placenta covering the internal os and extending, extending posteriorly. B, low-lying placenta one centimeter from the internal os. C, retroplacental hematoma. Or D, normal placental position with no abnormalities. So I'll give you a minute to think about that. So that is going to be C, retroplacental hematoma. So first, what is the likely diagnosis in this patient? Well, first, does this patient have crab? And when I say that out loud, that doesn't sound so good, but yes, she does. She has contractions, she has a rigid uterus, she has abdominal pain, and she has bleeding. So her suspicion for placental abruption should be high. Then the vignette also mentions she was in a motor vehicle accident, which we also know is a risk factor for placental abruption. And finally, it mentions cocaine and cigarette use. Highly likely this patient has a placental abruption. And as we discussed earlier, while this may not be found in all patients, a retroplacental hematoma or clot is a classic ultrasound finding and strongly supports the diagnosis.
All right, question three. For the patient referenced in the previous question, what underlying pathophysiological mechanism is most likely responsible for their condition? So this, you got to kind of think back to what we were talking about before. I'll give you a minute to think about that. So that is going to be rupture of maternal vessels in the decidua basalis. So remember, in placental abruption, vessels in the decidua basalis rupture. These ruptured vessels bleed and accumulate, which eventually cause the placenta to separate, the placenta to separate and peel away. All right, so hopefully that was helpful. I try to make it as quick and straightforward as I could. Hopefully the mnemonics helped. Thank you, as always, for watching the videos and the support. I truly do appreciate it.